Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to be starting in just a moment. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I hope you received my email. We're very sorry for the confusion. Um, our Zoom had uh, it's this webinar starting at 1230, um, but it does did indeed start at 1. So we really apologize. The slides and the recording will be up on um, our MHTTC website, and we'll give you the link to that. Um, hopefully by the end of the today, if not tomorrow. So um, if this was an inconvenience to you, you can still watch the recording in full um, shortly. So uh, welcome everyone to today's webinar, Trauma Affect Regulation Guide for Education and Therapy Target, Universal Selective and Indicated Prevention and Intervention in the Schools with our presenter, Dr. Julianne Ford. This website or webinar is co-sponsored by the Great Lakes MHTTC and SAMHSA. The Great Lakes ATTC, MHTTC, and PTTC are funded by SAMHSA under the following cooperative agreements. This, the opinions expressed in this webinar are the views of the speaker and do not reflect the official position of the Department of Health and Human Services and SAMHSA. The MHTTC network believes that words matter and uses affirming, respectful and recovery oriented language in all activities. For more upcoming events and information, please follow the Great Lakes MHTTC on social media or visit our website. Um, a few housekeeping items, technical issues. If you are having any technical issues, please individually message Rebecca Buller or Alyssa Kuala in the chat section at the bottom of your screen and they will be happy to assist you. Questions for the speaker, please put any questions in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen and we will do our best to get those questions to our presenter. We will be using live transcription during the presentation. And at the end of this session, you will be automatically redirected to a very brief survey. Certificates of attendance will be sent out via email to all who attended the session in full. This can take up to two weeks. And as I said, the recording and presentation slides will be up on the MHTTC website. And we have it, it says in the next two weeks, but it will be hopefully by the end of today, if not tomorrow, if not today, tomorrow. Um, our presenter today is Dr. Julianne Ford, a board certified clinical psychologist and professor of psychiatry and law at the University of Connecticut, where he directs two treatment and services adaptation centers in the National Child Traumatic Stress Network, the Center for Trauma Recovery and Juvenile Justice, and the Center for the Treatment of Developmental Trauma Disorders. Dr. Ford is past president of the International Society for Traumatic Stress Studies and a fellow of the American Psychological Association. He has published more than 250 articles and book chapters and is the author, of, author or editor of 10 books, including Treating Complex Traumatic Stress Disorders in Children and Adolescents, Scientific Foundations and Therapeutic Models. Dr. Ford developed and has conducted randomized clinical trial and effectiveness studies with the Trauma Affect Regulation Guide for Education and Therapy target model for youths and adults. Thanks again for everybody um, being here. And Dr. Ford, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thanks very much, Jen. Are my slides viewable on the screen? Yes, they are. Okay, excellent, good. Well, thanks for that introduction. It's, it's, a, it's a great privilege to be able to talk with your uh, attendees, uh, who I know work in school mental health and probably in other areas of mental health that it serve the school systems. And I'm going to try to give you a, a quick but thorough overview of an approach that is intended to be very practical, given the current situation where I know that, that everyone in the school systems and everyone in the mental health systems and healthcare more generally are very stretched have to make the most of small amounts of time and have very heavy caseloads in many cases. So what, what I'm gonna talk about is something that hopefully will add to your toolkit, but not add to the burden. And we're gonna focus on trauma only because 
uh, traumatic stress is is one of the ways in which uh, kids in schools and, and in the community often experience the, a, a pr profound shift that can then lead them to have mental health difficulties. Now, trauma doesn't cause all mental health difficulties, uh, and not every child or student who's having some mental health difficulties has experienced trauma, but so many have, and it is such a, a factor in so many different mental health problems, psychiatric illnesses, uh, that it's the kind of a, a, a glue that can stick everything in a very problematic way, but it could also be a, a real major opportunity. So let's talk about an approach. Whoops, here we go. So I, I want you to know that I do have uh, a, an interest, although I'm an unpaid consultant for the team that actually implements this intervention. And it's, so if you're interested in more detailed information about the intervention and its actual implementation, which is beyond what I can talk about today, Advanced Trauma Solutions Professionals is a small business that the University of Connecticut actually set up in order to disseminate the target model. Um, and there's some wonderful people there. If you just Google that, you'll find their website. So I'm going to talk to you about what, what is this target model? How can it be used in school as a, an approach to prevention, uh, including tertiary prevention or indicated prevention, that is when kids are already having significant problems, so really in counseling and therapeutic work, as well as in preventive work, and how it can also be used in the aftermath of incidents, uh, where we're all increasingly concerned about the potential for and the actuality of violence in our schools and in our communities affecting kids and families. So the core thought here is that when kids experience traumatic stress, the, these are stressors that sometimes are chronic, sometimes they are just a single incident, but what they really do is they threaten a, a child or a family's sense of survival. Uh, and that may be emotional survival, it may be psychological, it may be physical. It, it may be the survival of relationships that they count on. So there are many different ways in which survival can become a kind of a dominant factor for a child, a family, an entire community, a school, a school system. Um, and we know that that's happening when people in that environment become focused on survival coping. And the cores of survival coping really are three basic things. Hypervigilance, that is being on guard all the time, often such in such a way that the person or the entire group is not even aware of how on guard they are. It's not aware of how much they are constantly scanning and mobilizing in anticipation of potential threats, minor threats as well as major threats. When you're constantly on guard, then it's, it's very difficult not to be frustrated, irritable, and prone to wanting to basically push back against any potential threat or any potential barrier in a, that's in your path. And that can lead to what looks like and sometimes is actually aggression. Most of the aggression that we see from kids um, in schools and in the community, it's not intended to do harm. Uh, but it is often, it can be harmful, it can be verbal, it, but it can also be physical. The key here is that this is aggression that is not intended to hurt or to injure, even though that may occur. It's intended to protect and to ward off threats and to prevent uh, others from viewing oneself or one's group as vulnerable or weak. And then there's also ultimately with, with this combination, there's a, there's a fundamental sense of hopelessness that life is just simply one challenge or threat after another and it never gets any better. Now that's a, that's a pretty heavy combination. What I think we need to do is to take that fundamental sense of hypervigilance, always being on guard, ready to push back, doing unto others before they do unto you, and feeling just a fundamental sense of hopelessness and translate that into something where we can help kids and where we're not caught up in the hypervigilance and trying to fight off this problem and ultimately feeling hopeless ourselves. So this approach that I'm gonna to talk to you about, it really is intended to take this complex challenge of stress and traumatic stress 
and to demystify it and to break it down into uh, aspects that, that anyone can understand. And in fact, kids often understand this much more quickly than, than adults do. But let's test our, all of our uh, capacities for new knowledge here. And hopefully much of this will be things that are familiar to you, but maybe a slightly different twist that can be useful. So in target, we have two basic elements. We have some education that's intended to clarify how trauma affects the body and the brain and why that leads to reactions that can then become very serious problems, whether they're behavioral problems or academic problems or relational problems, or even ultimately life-threatening problems like suicidality. So it's intended, it's education that breaks down stress into a very understandable challenge and then provides tools that are very specific that anyone can use. You don't have to be a rocket scientist. So some of this has been written in a, in a paperback that uh, life coach and minister John Wartman and I put together in case you're interested in that. But I'll, I'll explain it to you very quickly. So what, what we know is that, of course, stress affects so much of the body. It affects our breathing. It affects our heart rate. It shifts the way that blood flows throughout our body. And it moves blood away from the gut where we need to digest and be able to actually kind of calm ourselves. A lot of that is really gut sense and shifts it into the muscles to mobilize for action. It constricts the peripheral blood vessels. That's that sense that you're tingling and you're, you're just basically feeling a sense of on edgeness. And then of course there's sweat and there sometimes can be trembling and there's a focus on threat. And that can lead to very, very limited black and white thinking, good or bad, who's against me, who's with me, what do I have to do about that? Let's shift that focus. And so we start with how stress affects the body, but we really focus and target on how stress affects the brain, because the brain is where it all begins. And we break it down into three basic components in the brain. There is an alarm in the brain. And if you didn't know that, you, you do know what I'm talking about because that's the signal that you get when you know that you need to wake up and pay attention. Or it's also the signal that you get when there's something really dangerous. And it can range from a minor wake up call to a very major survival wake up call and a seven, seven bell alarm kind of reaction. That alarm is triggered when we experience stress. When that happens then, the alarm actually sends a message to another area in the brain, and that we call the filing center. Technically, this is the amygdala, the alarm, and the hippocampus, the memory filing center. We, we don't go, we don't emphasize the technical names, but sometimes kids actually like to know those, and it's good for science. So the thinking center is actually where memories are stored, where they are actually also and retrieved. And it's, it's a center that helps us to ask, literally orient ourselves to current situations. So when the alarm signals that something is needing our attention, then the, the, the memory filing center, when things are working as we would hope, the memory filing center pulls up memories that help us figure out what the situation is and how we can best handle it. That then sends a message up to the thinking center, which is the prefrontal cortex or right at the front of the brain. And you notice there's a bit of a gap there. The alarm and the filing center are very close to each other, so they connect very quickly. And then there's a little bit of a gap between this information getting up to the thinking center where we consciously figure out what's going on and what we need to do about it. So how does this work when stress occurs? Well, when something stressful occurs, the alarm signals that we need to pay attention and do something, but that's not clear. The filing center then provides some contextual information. It gives you a sense of what's going on, so to speak. And then that information is relayed to the thinking center. And when that information gets to the thinking center and we are informed and we are able to make a plan and figure out how to handle the situation, that then creates not only a sense of calm, and confidence, but it also resets the alarm. 
So that's this crucial arrow underneath. And it's the resetting of the alarm that is fundamental because when stress has become chronic or is traumatic, that's when the alarm can take over and essentially hijack our brain and our body and our entire lives. And the hijacking is very simple in the sense that it's not nothing terrible is happening that is a, a, a drastic adversary enemy. It's just simply an alarm that has gotten turned on so strongly that it essentially crashes the filing center. And so the memories that we get that we pull up are memories of problems, of hopelessness, of threats. We, we immediately focus on everything bad in the situation. And you see this with kids where they can go from just seemingly being fine in a particular setting. And then all of a sudden they're completely going ballistic or they're totally shutting down or they just get really frustrated and irritable and they don't concentrate very well. All of those reactions, they may, they may have other sources. It's not always trauma. But in many cases, it's exactly because this alarm in their brain has been activated. And in most cases, it's not by trauma itself, it's by reminders. It's by triggers that bring back a sense of being under threat, even when the threat may not be present at all. And that's why it can look like kids overreacting, just being completely unmotivated, unwilling to cooperate, easily too easily irritable getting into fights all of these kinds of problems a core dilemma for all of them is that the stress alarm has gotten triggered and this isn't just true for kids who've experienced trauma although unfortunately so many kids have experienced trauma that that's going to play a role but this can occur when stress reactions are just chronic over time and this alarm in the brain becomes essentially stuck on and when that happens then the memory filing center is really not pulling up the memories we need. It's pulling up the memories of things that we need to protect ourselves from, which may not be relevant. In fact, actually may be seriously problematic. And at this moment, and then that crashes the hard drive. And so now we've got an individual student, teacher, any of us who's operating essentially in survival mode. And their alarm is telling them they have to do something, but they have no clear sense of what they need to do because they're not able to think clearly. Again, not because of a, a fundamental cognitive or brain deficiency, but simply because of a brain that is focused on survival and alarm. So what we're really trying to do here is, is then help kids to recognize when their alarms are turned on. And most of the time in schools and in the community, this will not be because of trauma, but when the alarm reaction is very intense and it's a hot, hot reaction on the spectrum, that's very often fueled by past traumas or by chronic stressors. And the, the moment that the alarm is triggered currently may just be a final straw. And that may not be the fundamental issue, but we can't always dig in and know exactly all the trauma history that, it, that any particular student has had. It's helpful to know whatever we can, but even when you don't know that, you can judge the intensity of the alarm reaction. That's what tells us when there's a need to intervene and to intervene in a way that doesn't further activate the alarm. So what we've developed in Target and I, this comes largely from people who have experienced chronic stress, not from textbooks, although it fits with what we know about how stress and the body and the brain actually do work, as I've just shown you. We've come up with seven basic steps. Looks very simple. Once you get used to it, it actually isn't all that difficult to apply, but it does take some careful thought. So I'm going to walk you through these seven steps, which actually spell freedom. And that can be useful if you're doing this, for example, in a counseling group. Um, it's probably less useful in a class um, or in a single intervention, a brief intervention. But we have a, a, a scaled back version that doesn't require all seven steps as well. So let's start with the first step. And that's focusing. And if nothing else that I tell you today makes any sense, 
I hope that this will be something that will resonate and that will seem like a tool that you could potentially use. And you're welcome to use it in any way that you wish, as long as you follow the basic, basic principles here. Because what we're talking about is not a relaxation exercise. This is not a, a way to immediately reorient people when they are super stressed. It can help in de-escalating a, a youth or a group that is in crisis mode. But fundamentally, this is a, a kind of a form of mindful practice. Um, and I'm not all that good at mindfulness, so I needed to kind of simplify it. And with the help of many clients and many students, here's what we've come up with. Fun essentially, mindful reorientation and resetting of the alarm in three simple steps, SOS. So the first step is simply to slow down. And that's not an, an obvious or even a natural thing when we're in a state of high mobilization or hypervigilance. It's also not often easy for kids who tend to be fairly reactive just because of their development and their constantly changing biology, especially as they move from latency into pre-adolescence and adolescence, but even younger kids can be pretty high energy. And so slowing down does not mean stopping and it does not mean in any way, shape or form attempting to just control an, oneself, but to step back and just take a moment and not do anything other than just allow whatever thoughts come to mind and just to have a moment of quiet and peacefulness. And again, this may be very difficult to do for kids. It's not their natural state, but they can become very much involved in this for an entire class. We found that when teachers do this as a regular practice, not just once in a while, that kids actually start to take this in. At first, they might laugh about it and say, this is stupid, it's ridiculous. But gradually, they come to recognize, you know, it actually, it's nice to be able to just stop and just do nothing for a moment and just sweep your mind clear. And again, you can do this in diff many different ways. You can do it with music. You can do it with poetry. You can do it with even a brief film that is geared to just quieting the mind. You can do it with words as I am now. And you can do it just simply with silence. After slowing down just for a moment, the next portion, the O is to orient. Um, and that's really a, an essential and often overlooked aspect. And the key here is to shift from thinking about nothing in particular, which is fine, to thinking about one thing and being very focused. And kids of all ages like this because they like to focus on things that are important to them. Our job then I think is to help them use that capacity to focus by focusing on one thought right at this moment that is whatever is most important in your life. And for older kids, for adults, we also sometimes include whatever is most important based on your core values and who you are as a person. And that can be a very helpful reminder to step out of the immediate moment and go back to what's fundamental and important. I'll show you some examples of, of orienting thoughts. But again, they're very individual and they, they're not prescribed by anyone else. Each, in, each person chooses their own. They may be a, a thought in words. They may be a song, a lyric from, a mu from music. They may be a, a particular person who's really important and who you feel safe and trusting and caring with and for. The orienting thought then is, a, is an opportunity. And again, this has to be practiced again and again. It can't just be done on the spur of the moment. But that orienting thought and the ability to shift from what's out there and 
what's happening in your body right this moment to just shifting to what you choose based on who you are as a person and what's most important to you. That can fundamentally change everything if it's done again and again. And then the self-check, the, the second S, is very simple. We, we tend to focus on, sorry, on two things that are helpful to rate for kids often and for adults as well. And one is stress level. So we have a stress thermometer, which I, I'm sorry, it looks like it got omitted from my slides, but it's just basically a, a scale from one to 10 that looks like a thermometer. One being no stress at all and 10 being the worst ever. And of course, if in doing this with kids, with students, if if a student says that their stress level is a nine or a 10, that's a that's a, a signal to find a way to step aside or have someone who is prepared to do so step aside and just talk with that boy or that girl, you know, what what's happening in their life that's making it a nine or a 10. It might be something that's perfectly manageable and they're just really upset. But it could also be that could be a red flag indicating you know something very serious is happening so we don't expect that to happen most of the times kids rate their stress level as you know six seven eight sometimes low but usually toward the high end the important rating however that that's really to that i would suggest to focus on is the personal control so that's a scale just like the stress scale, one to 10. And on that scale, what we're talking about is no control at all, meaning that you're just not thinking clearly and you just, you're feeling and thinking very dis, in a very disorganized manner. And 10 being control where you're thinking as clearly as you've ever been able to think in your life. Different kind of control than just being able to make things happen the way you want them. This is the kind of control that comes from being able to think clearly. And that's what we focus on in this particular approach, because that's where control really comes from. So here are some example orienting thoughts. Um, a colleague kindly lent me a picture of, of his orienting thought, which is a picture of his daughter. Um, but it can be words like you see on the screen. Um, that have particular meaning. Um, and it's whatever makes a difference to that individual and gives them a sense of being able to just focus for a moment on what gives them a sense of calm, confidence, and security. And we might not use that word, those words with younger kids, might just say, let's just have a, a happy thought, a thought that really makes you happy and where you feel really good. So again, this has to be adapted for different ages, but the core of it, oh, here's our thermometers, so you can see them. Now, when we're doing this beyond the SOS, we, we also think that it's, it's really important to help kids to take some additional steps. It's not always possible in a, in a particular setting, but when it is possible, once you've focused, it's really important to be able to identify what's triggering your alarm. Um, and we all know that there are many, many different types of alarm triggers, so I won't go into that. And once we've recognized that there's a trigger and my, our alarm is on, whether it's we see it in ourselves or we see it in one of the kids we're working with or teaching, then we walk through these additional steps and we help the, the boy or the girl or we do our own internal processing and we figure out, you know, what am I feeling that's driven by my alarm? What am I thinking? That's just basically a reactive thought. What are my goals that are just very impulsive right at this moment or the students? And how does that then lead to choices that are probably problematic? But we also walk through this, the, the same set of areas and we, we think in terms of what is it that this boy or this girl, or I myself, if I'm doing this, what is it that is really helping me to stay focused and grounded? What are the emotions that I have? And maybe they're in the background, but I, can, I need to be able to kind of bring them back into focus. Confidence, happiness, interest, 
hopefulness. And those then lead to thoughts that are much more focused on what's possible and who I am as a person. So what you see is in each of these steps, we're essentially replicating the SOS, but we're focusing on emotions at one step, we're th focusing on thoughts at another, we're then focusing on, on goals, and ultimately, we're then focusing on the choices that kids make and that we make. And that walks us through. And again, that, that second side that's really crucial, the first side, the left side that I showed you was really the alarm, the, the reactive. The main is what helps the individual, whether it's a student or we ourselves or a, a client, to be able to come back to what is truly important in our lives. So you see, there's a lot of redundancy to this, but the repetition is, in, is on purpose. It's not to be boring. It's because the core thought here is when our alarms get turned on, the one thing that we can do to activate the thinking center and to begin to reset the alarm is to come back to our core values, our orienting thoughts, what is main and uh, what is basically the source of true confidence and happiness in our lives. Again, when kids are unhappy, when kids are under stress, when teachers and school personnel are under stress, I realize it's very difficult to get to this. And that's why it, it really does take some repetition and some persistence. But the important thing here is that this is a way for students, teachers, mental health personnel, administrators, for all of us to be able to make a contribution. Because every time that we notice an alarm reaction and we help to reset that in ourselves or in someone with whom we're working, that then changes the entire environment. It doesn't undo all the stress, but it begins to shift the stress into resilience. So what if you only have a short amount of time? And I see I only have a short amount of time, so I'm going to move right through this. This doesn't have to be done in seven steps. It can be done in four steps. And those four steps are starting with recognizing the alarm reaction. So here we're now we're getting really practical um, and then figuring out what, what's the trigger right at the moment and then doing the focusing. So here we shift the order a little bit and you see how this can, this is a, a, a sequence of processing that can be shifted in order in order to accomplish different purposes. So for a relatively rapid focused way of addressing immediate stressors or reactions that are based upon reminders of past stressors, identifying the alarm reaction is often the most important thing. Because if you don't know that your alarm is going off or if a student doesn't know that their alarm is going off, they're not going to know that they need to do something to reset their alarm. If they know about their alarm and they know that resetting it is really the solution that can give them what they want, it's not just what we as adults are telling them to do. It's not just a matter of calming down. It's a matter of finding that focus so you can achieve what you want to achieve rather than just being caught up in an alarm reaction that leads to trouble or just doesn't lead to any benefit. And once focused, it becomes much more possible to identify a goal that is truly what the individual wants. So we have a, a, a way of showing this graphically that you can turn into a poster, put up in a classroom or in a counseling center or anywhere you want. And we also have, a, we have worksheets where you can help kids to literally walk through these four steps in a very practical manner. So what, what, what was your alarm reaction? How did you know that your alarm was going off? What were the triggers? And you find that, of course, as you might imagine, it's, it's not always evident to kids or even to us ourselves when we're in alarm state. But with some careful and sensitive assistance, it's possible to actually recognize, yeah, I guess I was pretty angry. And I guess that's my alarm going off. That doesn't mean I'm an angry person. 
that means my alarm was going off and I needed to figure out what the trigger was. And then I needed to focus. And when I was focused, and once I focused, then I could figure out what I really wanted to accomplish in this situation, rather than the usual, just reacting and I didn't even think about it. So this is really a way of being able to shift from ready, fire, aim to ready, aim, and then achieve, not fire at all. So can this be used as a universal prevention? Well, uh, we've, we've worked with a number of, of schools. We've worked with schools in uh, settings where kids are highly stressed, whether it's juvenile justice or child, child welfare or children's psychiatric program, but also just in regular schools, public schools and private schools. And when teachers use the SOS and they are supported by their mental health colleagues, then this can actually become a way of teaching kids that they have a way of understanding their own reactions. It's not something bad about them. And they have a way of actually resetting when their alarm is going off and when otherwise they might just go into a state of total irritation or total shutdown. And again, it's not a complete solution, but it is part of the beginning, at least, of helping kids to have a way of understanding their reactions without thinking of them as just simply symptoms of some kind of disorder that is a terrible problem that I have and I have to get over. They may be symptoms of a disorder, but that's not helpful for most kids and for most parents and for most of us. But if they are reactions because our alarm has been triggered and we know what to do, we know that focusing is what we need to do then even if we're not able to focus all that well, it becomes something that becomes gradually more and more possible. I'll tell you one very quick example. This is from a, a whole different setting, but this is a group of young men, boys and young men, who were in a program because they'd gotten into trouble with the law. Um, and they were trying to get back into their mainstream schools and we were, and we were doing everything we could to assist them. Um, and part of that was to be in a group where they learned this, this whole approach and these skills. And one time, one of the group members came into the group and said, oh my gosh, I'm so glad to be back here, which is a very shocking thing to hear from a teenager. Um, but he, he actually meant it and he said, I, I have been in so much trouble and I just barely got through it. He said, bottom line, I, I won't tell you the whole story, but he got pulled into uh, a, a very, very illegal action by a friend. Um, he's responsible for himself, of course, but he got pulled into it um, and they literally stole a car. Uh, and so this is a more extreme example than most that you will encounter, um, but it, it illustrates the point. Because what happened was in the midst of jacking this car, this young man he, his friend got him to do the driving and he, he realized, oh my gosh, there's a flashing light behind me. There's a police car and they're, they're telling me I have to stop. I'm in big trouble. And he said, my first impulse, first thing I thought of was, you know, pedal to the metal. You know, that's what I always do. Just take off and hope for the best. And he said, but then something really weird happened. All of a sudden, I just started thinking SOS. And he said, I, I didn't do an SOS. <laughs> I, I was too stressed out and, and to, to go through those three steps, but I just kept thinking SOS. And he said, and the, as I thought it, I realized, wait a minute, I don't want to do what I've always done. You know, I know I'm in big trouble, but I need to stop because what's important to me here is I don't want to keep going down the same path. And we talked about this and he'd, he'd been in group after group and session after session talking about that and it never seemed to stick. This time it really stuck. Now, we don't know exactly why. But what I can tell you is that having done the SOS enough times, even though he couldn't just pop it out like a tool at that particular moment, it was a part of his way of thinking at that point. And it enabled him 
to shift his focus to what was really important. And so he literally did stop. He was arrested. He, was, he, he had to go to detention. He, he went before the judge after a couple of days and the judge actually told him that he was impressed. He did not want to see this young man back ever again. He was not impressed that he once again gotten involved in, in something illegal. He said, but he was really impressed because this is the first time that he'd seen the evidence that this young man actually knew that he had to stop and he had to change. And so he said, you can, I'm going to extend your probation, but you can go back home and go back to that group and whatever it is you're learning in that group, keep doing that. And the young man said to himself, you know, I don't know if it's what I learned, but you know, that SOS, I give you that as an example, because it's the kind of thing that happens when this approach is taken and it's infused into ongoing counseling or better yet into ongoing education. And so kids really learn that they can tap into their ability to actually reset and to focus on what's important. And if every preteen, teenager, even younger kids could do that, I think we would have a, a, a much different setting in which we were working. It wouldn't change all of our problems. It wouldn't reduce all the funding challenges and other kinds of structural issues, but it might just begin to shift the tide. And that's what we're seeing in classrooms and in schools. So it's a preventive activity because it helps kids to know that they need to be focused and it gives them a way to focus. That's very practical. So it's a shorthand to also to help kids to understand why their reactions, which get them into a lot of trouble or get them labeled often, that these are not signs of something bad about them. They are reactions that all of us have and we simply all need to be responsible for resetting our alarm. And this can be then incorporated into educational materials. Uh, we've got worksheets and materials that are, can be used in counseling, but they can also be used in classes. It's a way of basically introducing kids to stress and even trauma without the focus on the capital T trauma, the focus on stress, resilience, and drawing on your capacity to focus. So here's some, some of the things that this approach can lead us to actually say to kids when they're in a, at a moment of crisis or, or having just a difficult moment and their alarm is going off, whether we're a parent, uh, excuse me, a teacher talking with a parent or a student or a, a mental health provider. If we focus on how we can work together with that and make this right, if we let them know that we won't give up on them because we see who they are as a person. And again, that can get very difficult to see when kids are in a fairly constant alarm state. And it's not true for every youth or for each of us. And if we are able to actually help by recognizing when our own alarms go off and tracking that as well as the alarms of others. And then remember that when alarms are going off, they often can escalate one another and you've got dueling alarms. My reactivity triggers this other person's reactivity. And now we've got several people who are in alarm state and you know what can happen in a classroom when this happens. Again, the crucial step is figuring out what's important, not what is the impulse, but what's important and for each individual involved. And then it becomes possible to actually figure out how to make something right when kids feel like something is terribly wrong in this moment. And maybe only take one small step toward that, not, not a total solution, but a step in the right direction and sticking with them until that step has begun. I know that this is probably all fairly rudimentary, but it fits in with this model because the model then gives us a way of sticking with the youth and focusing ourselves and helping them to focus. Now, 
The last thing I want to talk about just briefly, and then we'll have time for questions, is that when there are incidents, and it might be a violent incident, it may be a, a tragic uh, death because of suicide, where a student takes their own life. Um, when, when those kinds of incidents happen in a school or in a community where kids are going to school, it's really important to be able to have ways to talk with kids. Um, and I know that we all as mental health providers, we're often called upon to do this. Um, I can fully recall the, the intense urgency when the Sandy Hook Newtown incident happened almost 10 years ago this December. Um, and unfortunately, these are incidents that don't happen just once every 10 years. Uh, they probably have happened in schools where you are working. Uh, and when they do happen, um, it's not always possible to facilitate a, a perfect debriefing, but the crucial thing here is in, in any kind of a debriefing, whether it's with a, a group of parents, a, a class of students, a group of teachers, it's fundamentally important to recognize that this is not just a, a cathartic, just, you know, spill it all out and talk about the trauma and just get all emotional. The, the key here really is to help people to focus in on what's affected them the most, whether they're kids or adults, and then what is most important to them going forward. And to do that, We've got to, of course, be able to do that ourselves. And it's really important in, in those kinds of debriefings to highlight what the people we're talking with are already doing, whether they're students, parents, teachers, whomever they may be. Not just what they can do or should do for good self-care or to get through this awful tragedy and crisis, but what they're already doing. And the fact that just by being willing to sit together and support one another in thinking through what this all means and what we need to do in order to move forward together and restore a sense of safety and trust, just by being willing to participate in that, that's a major contribution. And most people don't think of it as such. They just think that they're, they're just doing what they have to but we can help them focus in on the fact that by providing support for one another, by listening, by sharing, but in a way that actually helps us find meaning, not just crisis and stress and awful distress, that by moving from the, the, the tragedy, the sadness, the horror, the distress, the anger, and acknowledging that, but moving through that to what is important. What do we want to focus on moving forward? Not what are we trying to prevent or what are we trying to do right that we didn't do right in the past, but what do we truly want to achieve in this school, in this community, in this class? So we've done a number of research studies on this, on this model. In case you're interested, they'll be in the, in the uh, PDF with the slides. Um, and with that, I think it's good to shift over to any questions that you have. Just a reminder to please put any questions in the chat or the Q&A section, and I would be happy to read them out to Dr. Ford. As of right now, Dr. Ford, we do not have any questions. Well, I hope that's because everybody is busy doing multiple SOSs. <laughs> <laughs> As a not not to reduce stress, but just because it's such a great way to build the mental muscles that then enable us to manage stress. But I am I'm really interested if if this triggers any thoughts, it, ways in which this seems unrealistic or not feasible or trying to do too much or not doing enough. Am I missing something here um, or just you know, when you think about applying this, what, what questions come to mind about how to actually translate this into your practice and into the schools with, with which you're working?
Well, while we're waiting, I'm going to go back and show you something. Since since you're not stopping me, you're going to have to you'll have to listen to me. But I'll wait for any I'll stop for any question. But just go back for a moment, and this is what we call a practice exercise for freedom. Now we tend to do this more in individual or group counseling rather than in an educational setting, but that could be in a school setting too, of course. And I just want to highlight how helpful it is to be able to walk through these steps because that that's really the, the young man who I told you about who came into the group. He, he basically walked through these steps and talking about what had happened. Oh, here's a question. All right. So would any adaptations be needed for children and adolescents with cognitive or learning impairments? Yes, absolutely. I'm very glad you asked that. Uh, for example, uh, for kids who have significant uh, learning or cognitive impairments, uh, again, more cognitive than learning, because uh, if, it, if it's primarily a learning issue, then it's a matter of finding the right medium and the way in which to present this to them, but it's not a matter of the complexity of the information. If there's a cognitive impairment, um, and for younger kids, where these steps might be a bit much, and that is very important to recognize, we will often scale this back, and we'll either go, we'll focus on the T4, which is basically just what set off your alarm, What's your alarm reaction? What's your alarm telling you right now? And then let's do an SOS. And in doing the SOS with kids who have cognitive impairments or who are younger, instead of doing the slow down, orient, and self-check, we'll, we, we've often shifted it and we just do something I'm sure is very familiar. We just do a red light, yellow light, green light. Um, and did this with a, uh, a boy at, in our children's psychiatric hospital, actually, uh, who really wanted to be able to turn his alarm down and he couldn't figure out how to do it and the SOS was too complicated. So we just worked with him and together we came up with a largely him saying the red light was stop, just stop. And when he knew that and he defined that, then Adults and others in his environment could say, okay, red light, time to stop. And he knew what it meant. It wasn't just coming out of the blue. And he was like, okay, that's, oh yeah, that's what, that's the plan. Then yellow light was just focus. So he liked the idea of focus and just think about one thing. And for him, often the one thing was like the candy that I want right now, or uh, the, the TV show that I, I'm, I want to watch tonight. So it's very, very basic practical things or just, you know, focusing by saying, okay, I just want you to smile at me, just smile. And then I'll know that you like me. Again, things that seem so simple, but they gave him a, some control over this whole process. And he now could see I'm stopping, I'm focusing. And then the, the green light was choose. And so then it became a question, what do you choose? And that's where the adults could then work with him on different choices he had. He could grab all the candy and just try to eat it all at once. He could take his time and pick out the piece of candy that he really wanted and really enjoy that. And so it became a way of teaching him a, a lot about mindfulness, but in a eight-year-old fashion. So that's an example there are many ways to scale this back, but definitely it, it, it needs to be done when this is too complicated. And the SOS is often a good place, but even it can be too complicated at some points. So that I hope that's a good example for you. I see another okay. question. Yep. We got two more questions in there. Um, first okay. one is, is there a certain amount of time that's been found most effective to teach children this method? Like a certain amount of sessions that you think would be ideal? We actually have found that this can be taught in as few as one or even two sessions. Um, it, however, the ideal is to teach it and then continue to reinforce and support it in the actual environment. So it can, it can be taught in one session when that's all you have. 
if if you have three or four sessions, then you can actually expand that out and teach, for example, the four step approach. If you have a two or three sessions, you might just do stress in the brain and your alarm in your brain and the SOS or some version of that. But the crucial thing is this then needs to be supported in actual daily life, whether it's in the classroom or out in the community. Um, and that kind of ongoing support is something that needs to continue on for as long as possible. Um, so there's no limit to that. And what we find is that when kids learn this, they'll start it. But if they don't get some support for it, then they'll drop it just like anything else. So again, can be taught briefly. The seven step approach that I'm showing you here on the screen, that usually takes more like eight to 12 sessions. So that's, that's a longer approach. The T4 approach can be taught in four or five sessions. And the SOS can be taught really in one or two sessions. Great, thank you, Dr. Ford. And then our last question before we wrap up, could you review some tips or guides for de-escalation, especially if there are youth who are activated and near the point of a physical altercation? Mm -hmm. Okay, absolutely. I think that's where applying the SOS without, but not saying to that, that youth, you gotta, you gotta do an SOS, but to say to that youth, let's just slow down. And you may have to say that 15 times and you may have to be calmly persistent and using some nonverbal kinds of assistance as well. Again, not pressuring or, or cornering them, but literally modeling that you are relaxed enough that even though you're, you're prepared, if, the, if something needs to be done, that you're relaxed enough so that you can just slow down and stay right with them. And then the orienting part of the SOS, at that moment, we never talk about orienting. We just say, okay, what is it that's important right now? What, what is the one thing that, that you need or that we need to do so that we can start to make things better? And again, you may have to repeat that. You may have to be creative in figuring out what that might be because the, the boy or the girl may be so stressed and so, and so alarm reactive that they may not be able to think of what it is that could make things better. That's where our knowledge of them and being able to suggest something that might help. What if we just walk outside together and just take a few minutes together and then we'll figure out what's just happened that's so upsetting and we'll make a plan together. How about if we do that? Now, again, it doesn't always work, but that's the core approach to de-escalation. You basically say, let's slow down, let's stop. I'm here with you. We will figure this out. And let's figure out, let's, let's do one thing right now that will make things a little better. And then we'll start planning how to make things better so that you can fix whatever the problem is or so that we can make things right again for you. You don't promise that you'll make everything right. You don't say everything's gonna be perfect. You don't say, oh, it's fine. You can just react all you want to, but I'll be perfectly nice. But what you do say always is, I will help you figure this out. Let's just slow down enough so that we can do this together. That's my, that's my two minute suggestion for de-escalation. I hope it's helpful. Thank you so much, Dr. Ford. And I appreciate everyone who was able to attend today's session. Um, I know we had one more question come in the Q&A, but given the timing, I would love to try to wrap this up. And before everyone goes, you will be redirected to a short survey. Um, please let us know how we did on today's survey. Um, and it's greatly appreciated. Thank you again, Dr. Ford. This was truly informative. And we look forward to having you on more sessions with us. Thank Thanks, you I'd be, be glad to come back. And yes, you can do this in the home. <laughs> All right, thank you. Bye now.